We are The God Culture, a group of independent researchers with no affiliation to any denomination nor organization whatsoever. We read the word and we test it as 1 Thessalonians 5.21 tells us, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. And man, is it good to be in his presence in all things. The time has come that we all understand this highly debated topic of the Sabbath. And we've broken it down very well so far, but we're going to go deeper. This is the big one. The one many have been waiting for. The famous Sermon on the Mount. We are told this is where Yahusha abolished that evil law of Moses, that law of sin and death. You know, those are among the most ignorant of accusations that anyone could possibly make, and that comes from scholars. Disgusting. How can we say this? Well, by the end of this video, you will know fully that Messiah reaffirmed the law of Moses indeed. Oh, we'll prove it because his words are clear, and there is no interpreting them any other way. Yep, that's what he did here. You would think such scholars would have done their research in the slightest on this topic. But as important as this sermon is and should be, it's really disregarded and dismissed in its true context because it's all right there in plain verbiage. Not really something anyone can question. You'll see for yourself. Instead, this has been mistreated and misrepresented and abused for centuries. And when you see this for yourself, you will be equally disgusted as we are. Yes, we are. Unless you are a troll here just trying to disprove or perhaps you're just looking to hang on a word here or there. Yes, we know some of you. We don't really care because you're meaningless in the scheme of things. The reality is... In that case, you're going to be extremely frustrated because we're going to prove this out in a way you can't disprove it. Now, because the facts are facts, and for starters, beginning your context of this verse by ignoring the start, oh yeah, that's what they have to do, I'll show you, you'll see, is true ignorance in every sense and the only way one could even arrive at this monumentally erroneous deception in fraud that we see portrayed in our churches many times today, and that's unfortunate. We've seen several throw this up already. Oh yeah, what about the Sermon on the Mount? Jesus did away with the law. That is ignorance at its worst, and you will know that by the end of this video. We'll show you the evidence and decide for yourself, because you are smart enough to do so without control Without someone telling you how to think, all we do is deliver you the information you decide. Just as you can read the word and you can understand it and discern for yourself, especially Pharisee 11. And you will find this is at least what's being peddled. There's a method employed here and some scholars use it, but many do not. And then it's taught in seminaries, and pastors take that into our communities where they attempt to share what they were taught. Of course, they are well-meaning and good men who, let's be clear, do not intend to deceive you. Don't anybody turn on your pastor and try to bring us into the formula. We've turned on no pastor, period. Unless they're attacking us, that's a little different. But those at the top, they are the ones who wish to deceive indeed. They do not want you to know the truth. Not about Ophir, not about any of the topics. John the Baptist living in Qumran. They still call it Qumran. Why do they call it Qumran? It's Bethabara. It's the biblical town. And yet, they keep a Muslim name. Yeah, they're really interested in restoring the word, aren't they? Not at all. Now, how do we know? Well, in the past eight videos. We uploaded to YouTube, for instance, in our five email boxes which subscribe to our channel and are subscribed, verified, they click the bell, all verified. 
we have not received one notice on either of these uploads. So they are choosing to censor us. That is what that is. Not notifying our own subscriber base. You gotta be kidding me. That's called censorship. It's not a glitch or it would have happened on one and maybe six, but not on all eight. That is purposeful. And during this lockdown, that's basically what evidently Google has decided. They're just going to lock down certain, especially Christian or channels teaching the Bible. Well, let's get to it. First, you know what? How exactly does Moses begin his, I'm sorry, Messiah, begin his famous Sermon on the Mount? Where does he start? Does he start by saying, I came to abolish the law for score and 20 years? No, he does not say that, does he? No, no, no. You know, do you know where it starts? Oh, you wait till you find out because we've covered it already and it is Amazing that anyone could take that and then take any of his sermon out of context from there. He sets it up. He tells us, but you'll see. One would think he does, though, based on what we hear, that he already abolished it from the beginning, that nasty, dirty law. You know, he says the very opposite. In fact, this whole thing is opposite, Phil. A bizarro world. I, I don't know if any of you remember. I use that term sometimes. Not sure if you know what I mean. But when I was a child uh, and watched Superman, <laughs> the cartoon, I don't know if any of you did, uh, Bizarro was the name of the anti-Superman. He was the opposite of Superman, and he was evil. And in his world, everything was backwards, really weird, right? Well, he must have been a Pharisee, because that is their world. We are in a bizarro world of Pharisee leaven here in which the legalistic Pharisees condemned as such, so they are. There's no way around knowing what the Bible describes as those who are legalistic. They're called Pharisees. They are not the tribes of Israel. That is ridiculous. Now, they're described as such by Messiah, and they are the ones pointing the finger, accusing of legalism. That's legalism to keep the Sabbath. No, it's legalism to do what you're doing and corrupt the Sabbath. It's legalism that you are using. That is the very basis and foundation of their argument. And it's a false one. You'll see. This is what they do, though. Every time you see a finger pointer, stop time. Walk over next to them in your mind and just see it from their perspective. Are they actually what they accuse? You know what? Almost every time, they are. Test it for yourself. Oh, you've seen this before, haven't you? Yet, this is actually the beginning of Messiah's Sermon on the Mount, setting up the context for the entire Sermon on the Mount. He cannot disagree with himself. He is God. Got that? How do we miss that? How do we buy Pharisee leaven on this kind of level of disgust and deceit? Anyone saying the rest of the sermon can disagree with this is a liar. Because if they were not, then he would have to be a liar. And he cannot be. And to call him such, come on, that's Pharisee crap leaven. See, that comes from Pharisees, ultimately, who do not believe the Bible, nor do they want you to, and they want to undermine Messiah, because that is what they're doing. They're calling him a liar. Let's read. Think not that I am come to destroy the law, or the prophets. What did the prophets write? The Old Testament. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. When does he do that? For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass. When does that happen? On the day of final judgment and not before, when heaven and earth are made new according to Revelation. One jot, iota, or one tittle, this is I or T, not one letter, shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Chapter 5 begins, by the way, with blessed are the poor, blah, 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 blah. Blessed, blessed, blessed. Beautiful, 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 beautiful context. And then where this salt, the light, all that. It, wonderful. We're not going to cover all of it because this video can only be so long. 
but beautiful. But it's not the law. This is the law part, and this is the first part of the law. This is where he goes into the law. Yes, he's going to talk about the law, and he just set the tone. He's not going to abolish it. Yet we're told he abolished it in the sermon that he says, I'm not going to abolish it. Does that make any sense? Oh, it definitely won't when you see the full context, because we're going to go into all of it. This is where it starts. I'm not going to abolish the law. This is used to beat on the Sabbath, especially, but and the law. So in this video, we're going to deal with the law of Moses, claiming it passed away. Yet, what did Messiah just say? I mean, what he actually said. I did not come to abolish the law, to destroy the law, period. He cannot then continue with a sermon which abolishes the law, or he's a liar. And he is not a liar, Pharisee. He is God. Get that. Now, context matters. Not one letter of the law will pass away until the day of final judgment. That's what Messiah says. Now tell me something. Do his words matter or not? They either do or they, uh, they, they do not. Either he is your Lord, he is the Son of Yahuwah, the Son of God, or he's not. And if you believe he is, then you must believe his words over any church, over any organization, over any pope, which is an Ill illegitimate biblical position anyway, usurping his throne on earth. This is when heaven and earth are made new, thus they pass. Whosoever, therefore, shall break one of the least, of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, hello, Pharisee, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, let's all be there, please, in that category. That's where we want to be, and we hope you do too. The same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. We're not here to condemn anyone. It's not what we do. It's not what we're about. We don't ridicule. That's not what we're doing. We're proving. Yes, I have attitude, and it will continue, because we are, and I am, disgusted by what they have done to the Word. It's terrible, but it is the paradigm in which we live, the strong delusion that was sent by Yahuwah. Let's, let's be honest. He allowed it for a reason, for a time. But that time is over. We are in the days of increasing knowledge, and we are going to know these things and restore them. Yes, we will. Those who love him will keep his commandments. He even warns scholars, right here, screw up this teaching, teach men to break my law, even the least of it. What law? He just said, the law and the prophets, the Old Testament law, the law of Moses, which is in place at the time that he's speaking, because he didn't change it. Certainly he didn't change it yet, not in one letter of any of Matthew. So even if you claim he did it here, well, he says this before he supposedly changes the law, which will prove to you he does not. So in other words, before even starting He's warning them if they abuse his words and this message, which has been done in this age and for centuries now, they will be the least in his kingdom. Now, some like learning from those who are the least in his kingdom. No, thank you. We have no interest. This is where you will find the most Pharisee leaven and likely those who aren't even saved by biblical definition. Sorry because they aren't even in relationship with him. They don't even know who he is. They just know their organization and structure. And Matthew 7 is very clear. There will be many such in the end that he will say, depart from me, for I never knew you. If you don't know him, well, yeah, you don't keep his commandments. But if you do, if you love him, you keep his commandments. That's what he says in John 15. That's what we see the church, the end times church in Revelation doing keeping his commandments. So what are they? Let's define. They have an affair with leaven. That's all they have. Ouch. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. 
you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. You can't even be saved if you stay at the level of a Pharisee, which is someone who goes around pretending that's what they do. That's what he says many times over. So why the Pharisees here? Why invoke them at all? I mean, he's starting his message on the law, and he, he invokes Pharisees. What is he doing? I mean, it's Yahusha. Uh, you're supposed to love them, Yahusha. And only say nice things. Because when you love somebody, you only say nice things. Only if he hated them would that be the case. Because their leaven will harm you, first of all. Are the Pharisees righteous? Not at all. And he makes that very clear. Many times over, but even right here. He's saying they're not righteous. Period. They're not even righteous enough to reach the level of salvation. That's pretty unrighteous. I mean, do you get that? This is not saying Pharisees are righteous, and you have to be more righteous than them. What? That's, they're not righteous. They're the opposite. What this sermon is about is a rejection of the Pharisee interpretation of the law. That's what he's setting up here, if you really look at it in context. He actually restores the law of Moses, you're going to see for yourself, and we are told the opposite, which is nonsense. From whom? Well, good people, meaning well. There's no doubt about that. We don't believe any pastor or scholar intends to harm you or deceive you. We don't believe that. We certainly weren't there when we were in the ministry. No, no, no. Thought we were doing good, but we were wrong. Ultimately, Pharisees is what they are because it is only their leaven, which basically they're talking about in sermons that are against Scripture, really. And it leads right back to them, and that is what the modern church has fallen for, Pharisee 11. It's really gross when you look at it, but let's break it down now. Could he be clearer here? Well, he will, don't worry. Now, this gets even worse as we go down the rabbit hole called theology, which is really Pharisee theology in origin. And we'll expose that. Uh, I say that because what we are taught is not what this passage represents at all, you'll see. It is outright wrong. And you'll see for yourself. Now, here's our method. In all of this, and these verses get us pretty much through the rest of chapter 5. This breaks down into six areas of law or categories, whatever you want to call them. Yes, even Princeton Theological Seminary and most of the seminaries would agree with that characterization, though it doesn't matter, but all pretty much agree that there's six general areas. And you go read their stuff, you see it over and over. Which we are told by them, because this is their interpretation in most cases, that Messiah is breaking the law here and changing it, installing a new one, replacing it. Well, we will take these and study them, and then take you back to the law of Moses, and we'll see, do these abolish the law of Moses? Or do they restore and reinforce them? And is he even addressing Moses in all of these? Actually, no. I mean, this is seen as a rebuke of Moses, but are, are we really... Forgetting who wrote the law with his finger? Do you see where this thinking leads? Because this is what it is. You talk about the ultimate undermining of the Father and the Son. This is it right here from the core. Yahuwah wrote this with his finger, the law of Moses, at least the Ten Commandments and some other law. This Pharisee leaven sets Yahusha at odds with correcting Yahuwah. And that can never be. He does what the Father does. He follows that example. He leads us to the Father. That is all he does. That is all he ever does and all he can do. Never can he go against the Father. Can't do it. So the paradigm is already very broken in the worst of ways when you think about it. Only the Pharisees would think in this way, and if you are, you can stop this now. 
See what you think and test this with scripture. You will find this matches and vets. Let's begin with what they term as anger. Although he starts talking about killing, but that's okay. We'll use their terms. Is there even a law, by the way, that deals with anger, specifically in the law of Moses? Actually, not really directly, but let's see. Does this abolish the law of Moses? Ye have heard that it was said of them of old time. Now, you're going to see that in some of these, but not all. And there's a reason for that. What does he mean, them of old time? Well, each time he uses that specifically, you will find he invokes one of the Ten Commandments, typically. He refers to, definitely, the law of Moses when he says that. That's them of old time. Okay, so he does invoke it, but watch how he treats it. What law? Let's see. Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Indeed. Now well, there you go. That's the sixth commandment that he just invoked. Does he overrule it? Well, you'll see he does not. But the rest of this is not the sixth commandment. He's going off into a different area. He's dealing with anger, not killing necessarily. Let's read. But I say unto you, now see, that's where they try to frame Messiah is saying the latter is wrong because but I say unto you means, oh, well, that's wrong. No, it doesn't. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Not what you will see. Let's see. Let's see what he actually does and where he goes. Does he ever say thou shalt not kill? Well, that would be ludicrous. Of course, he does not say that. Well, wait a minute. So he's saying, thou shalt not kill is valid. He's validating the law. I mean, what is there to guess here? Now, let's continue with the anger part, because he's still doing the same. That whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Now, this does not require killing. It doesn't say that he kills his brother necessarily, although it could lead to that, and you could tie the two. Okay, that's fine. We'll go with that. And he's dealing with another part of the law here, though, which we'll show you, which has been misinterpreted by Pharisees and the doctrines of men of that age. See, that's what we're looking at here. He certainly is not rebuking the law of Moses, nor is he changing it. You'll see. Now, that is what he is correcting here, not Moses. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Now, it continues, so let's finish it. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. In other words, don't sacrifice. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Oh, by the way, what day do they do that in the week? The Sabbath. He's invoking the Sabbath, not doing away with it. <laughs> Amazing. So, don't even offer sacrifices if you are in unforgiveness. If you're in anger with your brother, go and reconcile with him first. Very wise, very good, and, by the way, affirms the law. We'll see. Because that is when one does such on the Sabbath. You will find he doesn't even mention Sabbath, by the way, in this whole entire sermon. So how could he do away with it? He doesn't even talk about it. <laughs> Amazing. Yet, it's claimed this sermon abolishes the Sabbath. Nonsense. But we're going to cover it because saying the law. So let's just deal with it directly. Okay, now, what did Moses say? You know the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. Not news to anybody. It doesn't deal with anger, specifically against your brother. Though, so we have to go outside the Ten Commandments into the rest of the law to find that portion of what he's saying. However, does he say that it's now okay to kill of course not. 
he reaffirms the sixth commandment. Does Messiah disagree with Moses? Uh, Let's see. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. Uh, Ding, 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 ding. That's a match, folks. But thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Haven't we seen that somewhere before? I am the Lord, Yahuwah. Oops, Moses just said the same thing. Messiah is not abandoning the law of Moses. He is reasserting it, and here he does so twice. With, first, don't kill, and second, don't hold the grudge against the children of thy people. It's the same thing. You cannot hold a grudge against your brother and be angry at him. You can't do it. So, Messiah is not abandoning the law of Moses. He is reaffirming it. Because obviously the doctrines of men have changed the meaning in this age in which he's speaking. This is what Pharisee Levin does. And that is what he told us when he set up the whole context of this whole sermon. It's right there. He reaffirms the law, and then he goes and he says the Pharisees have messed it up, and now he's going and addressing the things the Pharisees have messed up. Is this really difficult? How can we miss this? So we're off to a really bad start for most scholars already. They just don't seem to read and understand. The comprehension is poor. It's sad. This is because they are educated into a paradigm filled with the same Pharisee leaven that Messiah is rebuking, yet they're turning it into the opposite. How else could one taking a sermon of such rebuke of Pharisee leaven and turn it around the other way against Yahuwah, ultimately setting Yahuwah and Yahusha at odds with each other, which can never be and will never be. Literally, that's insanity. For anger, Messiah restored the law of Moses. Now, what about lust or adultery? Real, to be specific. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time. There it is again. Why? Well, he will invoke one of the Ten Commandments again. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Is that one of the Ten Commandments? It certainly is. Is he about to do away with it? Oh, let's read. But I say to you, is that the same as on the contrary? Not even remotely. Ugh, he's defining it. He's explaining it. And you'll see that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Is Messiah saying it is now okay to commit adultery? No. So how could this ever be framed that he is abolishing that law of Moses when he is saying the same thing? With more detail, yes. And is this detail really not? What has always been the proper way to interpret this this law? Of course, of course it has always been the same. Mankind hasn't changed in that sense. Adultery begins with your eyes and your heart. It doesn't just happen and never has. That hasn't changed. To say so is to defy human nature in utter ignorance. Oh, how did that happen? Duh. Right. Right. It doesn't work that way, and we all know that. That didn't just start in the New Testament either. It was still adultery in the old and still fitting of this very same law and definition. What he's doing is he's telling us how to interpret the Old Testament law of Moses, which is the same as the new one, which is not new at all. Got it? Let's keep reading. Now he offers further wisdom, which most certainly only reaffirms what he just said. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish. What's he doing? He's just explaining the law. That's all he's doing. He's not changing it here. And not that thy whole body 
should be cast into hell. So it's better to pluck out your right eye than to break the law. That's what he's saying here. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. He's being very extreme in figurative language here. Is he really telling people, oh, go cut your right arm off? Not really. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. But he is setting up priorities. Hell is more important than any body part, which is very appropriate with adultery, especially. <laughs> Think about it. Now, what does Messiah do? He doubles down on the law and against sin. There is no other way to interpret this, and certainly no saying it goes against what it clearly does not. Now, what does Moses say? Let's look. Not much, actually, in writing, just the seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, reaffirmed by Messiah. So what Messiah is doing is he defines when adultery begins and reasserts and reaffirms the law of Moses a second time, or really third, because the first one was two that he affirms. He is restoring the law of Moses, which has been under attack by Pharisee Levin again. We're three for three on that. What about divorce? Let's see. It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Notice, he actually doesn't quote the full law there. Why? He doesn't say that he's quoting the law. He just says, It hath been said. In other words, he's going to deal with Pharisee leaven. So here he goes. But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication. See that there? That is a reason for divorce. Always has been, by the way, also in the law of Moses. I'll show you. Causeth her to commit adultery. So, if he divorces his wife, unless there is adultery involved in the previous marriage, he causes her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced under those circumstances is what he's saying commits adultery. Now, does Messiah decree no divorce? No. He's agreeing with Moses. Actually, wait till you read what Moses says. It's the same thing. Only for those who cannot read and understand what is very plain language get this wrong. He is saying, there is one reason for divorce, period, fornication or adultery. Under this, Messiah says divorce is permissible. That's what he just said. No one can debate that. Just so you know, I am divorced and remarried myself. At the time, I was ministering, leading worship and helps ministry at a megachurch in Florida, in which that group of pastors assessed my situation and chose it was lawful, and they married my Filipino wife and I in their chapel with their full endorsement, many of those pastors even in attendance, but their full support. We continue to be vetted and by many since, and this woman is the largest blessing of my life. This is a blogger, somehow, who employs such distasteful, disgusting, and demonic poets who actually said, my wife, my wonderful wife, should be put away. How dare he? He better hope I am able to follow the commandments if I ever meet him. That's for sure. Now we'll leave that at that. He is a fraud. One of the guys has crushed him in debate, in fact, so he levels personal cyber libel because he keeps losing everything, and he even loses that. But we'll deal with him, no worries. Don't let people put you down, though. You're allowed to stand firm on the word. On this, I certainly do. Now, what does Moses say about divorce? 
When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes. Oh, you can't stop there. He keeps going. But you know what? This is what they were doing in that day. Oh, she doesn't have favor in my eyes anymore. I can divorce her. No, 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 no. That's not what it says. It's not what it ever said. It actually says the same thing Messiah says. You'll see. But see, here's the rub. Men in those days were stopping here in the law without reading, obviously, and Messiah's reasserting the law as written with explanation, but same. Here you go. Here it is. Because he hath found some uncleanness in her. What's uncleanness? Would not adultery in fornication be uncleanness? Of course. What Messiah is saying is uncleanness has a definition and has always been defined as fornication and adultery specifically. It is not a broad general term that can be applied to any kind of uncleanness of any sort. See, that's what Pharisees do. They distort things like that. You leave any part of the law like that that is not defined specifically, although it was. See, in the days of Moses, they knew uncleanness meant adultery. That wasn't in question. But now the Pharisees got a hold of it. Oh, it says uncleanness. Well, this is unclean. That's unclean. This is unclean. Oh, all these things are unclean. Oh, my wife, no, she aged. Therefore, it's unclean. I mean, come on. They could come up with every reason. In his time, they expanded the definition with their leaven to encompass all kinds of things. Now defined unclean. Giving a man license to divorce under most circumstances, pretty much. Which is not what the law ever said, nor did, nor intended. And Messiah is restoring it to its original intention. Let's read. Then let him write her a bill of divorcement. See, divorce is in the law, and divorce is still in the law under Messiah, but only for the same one reason, no other. And give it in her hand, and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another's wife. Which, by the way, Messiah does not do away with, but says the same thing. You cannot remarry the adulterer. That would be sin. That would be against the law. That's what he's explaining. It's so clear, and it's right there in plain language. So can they remarry? Yes, under the law, they can. We have people asking that question often, so let's deal with it now. Under Messiah's law, yes, he is only saying it is adultery to marry the adulterer of a previous marriage. Got that? This is really not that difficult, yet it eludes so many. Many people who don't really want to know the truth but wish to distort it. Are these different? Actually, these are pretty much the exact same. The law on divorce didn't change, remains the same. On anger, lust, adultery, and divorce, what does Messiah do? He actually restored the law of Moses back to its rightful place. This cannot be abolishing it when it agrees with it. That position is a Pharisee position from those who wish to expand the word to a point that it breaks its own law. That's what they're doing. And again, it sets Yahuwah and Yahusha at war in words with each other, which is nonsense. They do not get away with that. They don't get to. Sorry. Let's move on to the fourth of six points, which actually really it's five of seven thus far, and uh, because the first one was really two, and both reaffirmed the law, really, because it's not just anger, it's also thou shalt not kill. So he's also invoking the first commandment and affirming it. Now, the first three, or really four, are certainly totally misrepresented and turned into the opposite in the modern church generally. This is in no way a sermon against the law. This is a sermon reaffirming the law. Absolutely. Again, ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old. That's Moses. Now we're dealing with Moses. He's being specific. Again, he was not on the last one. Thou shalt not forswear thyself, 
but shalt perform unto the Lord, Yahuwah, thine oaths. Now we'll show Moses does say that. He definitely does. But understand, Moses says, to keep your word in any oath that you make or take. Is Messiah really saying the opposite? Is he saying, don't keep your word? He's telling people not to keep their word, really? No, that would be wrong. And that would be a direct opposite if that's what this was. It's not. So let's see. Keep going. But I say unto you, swear not at all. So what is he saying? It's wiser not to take an oath at all. See that? He's not saying the opposite because Moses is not telling you you must take an oath or to take an oath. He's saying if you do, keep your word, which remains good law to this day, by the way. Do you like it when someone does not keep their word? We don't. Keep going. Neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be, yea, yea, yes, yes, nay, nay, no, no. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. So let your yes be your yes and your no be no. That is awesome. And many of us struggle with this, in fact. In this age, when you do, you are called arrogant for letting your yes be yes and your no be no. Or overconfident, yet you're just showing confidence in your own foundation, because you have a foundation, which hopefully we all do. You're called full of yourself. Well, you know what? They're going to say stuff like that anyway. Who cares? People hate that. They hate confidence. You're not supposed to know anything, because that's the Pharisee world we live in. You can't know They'll even tell you on some things. You can't know where Ophir is. You can't know where the Garden of Eden is. Yet, when you prove it like we have, you can say it with confidence. Is that arrogance? No, that would be ridiculous. Confidence is not arrogance. The world doesn't want you to have foundation. They don't want you to keep the Sabbath or the law either. This is why the Pharisees try to undermine it, and they have all along for 2,000 plus years. This too is a situation clearly of Pharisee leaven entering the law in interpretation, which Messiah is correcting. That's what we're seeing here. Don't tell me you can't see this today. Many do not keep their word. Messiah's answer to this is, just don't give your word. Don't make an oath. Don't take oaths to organizations even in his name. What's he talking about? Well, what happens when you do that? Well, this again is the Pharisee way. You take an oath and learn a whole control system of structure that then forms a paradigm that boxes in your thinking. You become a robot. That's where we are. That is society in general today. Let's wake up and see this. He is warning us. We see this all the time as people respond with buzzwords or just have to know what denomination we are affiliated, even though we keep saying over and over, we don't have one. They want to put us in one of these boxes so they can oppose that box because they're usually opposition. This is why we take no such oath. We don't do it. No pledge to any organization nor denomination. Sorry, we just don't. So there's nothing to discuss and no box to put us in. Oh, we would have on many occasions, and some would have paid us handsomely to do so if we chose to. But no thank you. This is too important, the work that we are doing, because we need to restore his word in our lives. And I don't care. We don't care if that costs every penny for me that I've ever made 
And if I have to eat the ning ding and sabah every day, as long as I have my coffee, so be it. Seriously, this is real, folks. We have entered a new time, a new age. Don't you see it? Look at what just happened. This is new. This is new. We have never seen a lockdown like this. Not of well people. This is rare. That something was released that's harmful to mankind all over the earth. And it's killing many. We all need to prepare. Because if you have no foundation, meaning the Sabbath, the law, the name of God, that's foundation. That's the foundation from creation. Then you will wrap right into the beast system. You won't even know it. Now, let's keep going. What does Moses say? And ye shall not swear by my name falsely. So he doesn't say not to swear at all. He says don't do it falsely. Neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. Yahuwah, I am the Lord. Yahuwah, Elohim, Yahuwah. Does this say that you must take an oath? No. Does it say you should take an oath? No. It says if you do, don't do so falsely, especially swearing by Yah's name. That's not the opposite of what Messiah just said. He's not going against it. Here's another, and you'll see Moses' tone. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord, Yahuwah, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. So keep your word. That's what it's saying. If a woman also vow a vow unto the Lord, Yahuwah, and bind herself by a bond, being in her father's house in her youth. See, now here's the one thing. Is Messiah saying you can never take a vow? Well, what's marriage? Are you kidding? Of course he's okay with marriage. He blesses marriage. He endorses marriage. You're allowed to take a vow. He's not saying not to take any vows at all. But what he's saying is it's better not to take an oath. What is Moses saying here? He's saying if you give your word, keep it, period. He's telling you, you must take an oath? No. But understand the times of Messiah, when people are demanded by the Pharisees and the like, just as many churches today, sorry, but it's true in some cases, not all, and certainly in Judaism, that they bind you to an oath. Some call it a creed. Sound familiar? Whatever you want to call it, don't take it. You are to read the word and to test it because that kind of oath is actually called Freemasonry. Now, know it for yourself. And every doctrine of every church and organization needs to be tested against Scripture. Most definitely it needs to be tested no matter whom they are. Taking an oath under these circumstances is essentially committing to agree with everything they say. Because many times you don't even understand the oath that you're saying. And you never have to do that, nor should you ever be required to. Because any organization requiring such is breaking Messiah's words. Sorry, they've already broken Messiah's words. Forget about him trying to break Moses is, their, their sin is far more profound. Any organization requiring such is unsound, as it is clearly too weak in foundation to be tested, because that's what this is really about. But see for yourself, test it. Again, in the first three, he asserts the law of Moses, which is actually four, because the first one is two different laws. On this fourth one, he further defines it, to the times, which is very sensible. Think about it. This is a law written about 2,000 years prior and really never changed and stood all of that time. Imagine that. Or put it in modern terms. You live in a country of laws, right? If you introduce an update to a law of thousands of laws, 
And in the case of the Bible, I think they say it's 614. Never counted them, don't know for myself. But it's about that. It's a lot. There's a lot there. So in your country, if you introduce that and it gets passed and, you know, a few months later, does it replace that law? Does it replace that whole of the law, especially when you just endorse and reassert the first three of four, or really four of five? Come on. What a nonsensical way of thinking that is. On to number five, revenge, an eye for an eye. Does he change it? Well, better question is, it too being misapplied and misrepresented by Pharisee Levin, does it need to be corrected? Yeah, that turns out to be it, and you'll see. Ye have heard that it hath been said. From whom? Notice this is not from those of old this time. Notice. Who are the teachers in this particular age of Messiah? Who runs the synagogues? The Pharisees. So where have you heard it? Likely he is going to the Pharisees here. Not Levites, not from Moses, nor from Aaron, no, Pharisees. How do they say this? This misrepresents and redefines it to head in the opposite direction to justify murder even. That's how they're representing it in their law in that age. But let's read. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, that ye resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Get that? Get what he's saying? It is evil to interpret this in a way to harm others. In its original intent, it is straightforward. If you give me a scar, you are to receive the same type of scar. Of course, you don't want a scar. So the very threat of receiving the penalty under the law in ancient times, that's how this was applied, would mean you just simply would not give me a scar, right? Now that worked in ancient times, but it no longer does when the Pharisees manipulate this law to justify, well, this is how they justify hunting and killing believers to this day. Do you realize that? Did you know the Catholic Church still has a leader of the Inquisition in title still today, even? Against what? Think about it. Let's keep reading. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Why? Because stuff doesn't matter. Let him wallow in his evil with his stuff. Let him go ahead. He will pay the price for serving mammon. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him a twain, too. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Now, he's not saying with usury or interest, by the way, because that is unbiblical, yet the entire world economic system is built on that principle against Scripture today. See, that too is a Pharisee doctrine, even in the temple days. Huh. Which is why Messiah turned over the tables of the money changers, who are the what? Pawnbrokers of that day, or today we call them bankers. And still pawnbrokers, because that exists still. The world elite today, in fact. And they are Pharisees in origin. You can imagine him looking really prophetically, into the future of that practice and the righteous anger just boiled up, and rightfully so. See, anger can be righteous. Again, he never sinned, thus nothing wrong with what he did. Anger is not bad, not if it's righteous. However, it is permissible and necessary to get angry, righteously, at the changing of Scripture especially, which we are seeing in this Sermon of the mount. Now exposed. A misinterpretation by Pharisee Levin. We will always speak up on that. Now, what does Moses say? 
Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Absolutely, he does say an eye for an eye. Breach for breach, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. As he hath caused a blemish in a man, so shall it be done to him again. Yet Messiah is not referring to Moses, is he? He does not say those of old. No, he doesn't. He's referring to what the Pharisees are doing in his day. Now, this certainly seems to be what Messiah is addressing, and it sort of is, yes. In tone, it's, it is, but it is not, because the law in far, is far more encompassing than these fragments. It also says this, which these fragments must be interpreted through. Here's the problem. What does it mean, an eye for an eye? Well, let's read the rest of the law to understand how this must be interpreted because there are caveats that you can't interpret this the way that the Pharisees are interpreting it, which is what Messiah is addressing. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge, you saw this before, against thy children or the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, I am Yahuwah, the Lord. Okay, so, see, the former is to be interpreted through this lens. Why? Because the law is complete in interpretation, not in fragments. Yes, an eye for an eye, but not bearing a grudge, and you have to do so in love, loving your neighbor as yourself. It is a penalty. You do something, you pay the same price, but it is not to be done bearing a grudge. It's not to be done in revenge. It's not to be done outside of love. Yep, that second commandment, by the way, just so happens to be in Moses' law as well. No, it's not in the 10 word for word, but it is word for word in the law still. Amazing. Scholars just ignore so much scripture to arrive at these doctrines of men. Okay, so, in application, this law is actually not bad. However, in Pharisee 11, one can get carried away in revenge. Yet, the law does not allow for such revenge, does it? Thus, Messiah is just interpreting this in proper context. But in lieu of modern application at his time on this one, he says, love your neighbor, and further defines it. So, really, he's affirming. Moses' law. See, you can't love your neighbor and retaliate, so this was never about retaliation. You can't bear a grudge per the law of Moses. So if you're obeying the law, you can't apply this in that way, and that's what he's talking about. You cannot define this in any sense, in its original interpretation, as any different from what Messiah is saying here, really. However, as he reasserts this commandment, we will give them this one. We're going to give this to scholars. He changes it. There you go. He changed one. Not totally, not truly in context, but he rewords it so it cannot be misinterpreted anymore. And it's different. Yo, it's actually the same. Clarifying the law is not abolishing it. Scholars don't know this because they hardly read the law and the Old Testament. They are only New Testament scholars, and many call themselves that. So they're not being dishonest, except for that means they are not scholars of the Old Testament. And that's a problem, because no one can interpret the new without the old, according to Messiah, even in the Sermon of the Mount, because that's how he started this whole sermon. He is not abolishing the law. He cannot, and he does not. Now we'll give them this one of six. There's one. That's it, though. That was technically changed, indeed, yes, by really not changing it, though, in original intent. But in fact, scholars call this revenge and don't even get that the law of Moses forbids revenge, so it cannot be revenge. Duh. But let's go ahead, we'll mark this one in that column, and we'll give them one that is fine with us. One out of the six, pretty sad, actually. To then base entire doctrine of the entire church on that. 
But ask yourself this, does it undermine even so and abolish the whole of the law? Well, that would be a ridiculous conclusion. Only a fool could make such. Sorry we speak plain language here. Warning, always. Okay, we're on the last one now. Not looking good for modern so-called scholarship of many, anyway. We're not saying that some don't say what we're saying. There are some that do. Maybe not in the detail we have. I don't know. I haven't seen a Sabbath series as detailed as this one will end up being in the end. But if there is, wonderful. <laughs> That's a great thing. I hope, I wish we had access to it, actually. We haven't seen one that detail. Are we to hate our enemy? Were we ever to hate our enemy? Does Moses even say to hate thine enemy? Does the law ever say hate thine enemy? Actually, no, not at all. It's not there. This one point is solely dealing with Pharisee 11 after it reaffirms to love your neighbor, which is wording right there in the law of Moses, which we already showed you. Now, let's review. Ye have heard that it hath been said, again, not of old time, so not necessarily referring to the context within the Ten Commandments, although definitely this was found in Moses' writings, there's no doubt. Thou shalt love thy neighbor. That is law, by the way. He's quoting the law right there. The law of Moses and the law of Noah both include love thy neighbor. Hello. Now, the next part. This is not in the law. In fact, it's not in the law at all. And hate thine enemy. Oops. So who says that? Not Moses. Not Noah. That is Pharisee doctrine. He is dealing with Pharisees, not with Moses in correction. Get that? And that's why he didn't say of old time in the beginning. See? But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Now, does Moses say otherwise? No, you'll see. Does he say he is addressing Moses in this passage even? No, this isn't even in the law of Moses. He's not even talking about Moses. He really says he is not. Because Moses is of old time. So even doesn't identify Moses from the beginning. It's not there. This is very misconstrued in scholarship. Really badly. All right, let's finish this passage. And that pretty much finishes chapter 5. That ye may be the children of your Father, which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For ye love them which love you, if ye love them that love you. What reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? Of course the politicians do that. And if ye salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans, the politicians, do so? Of course they do. In fact, we've heard stories about how there are some politicians who are only giving out, doling out, even in this time, to those who voted for them. Not only is that completely foolish, because you could be picking up votes for the next election, pretty dumb, but also it's evil, period. But anyway, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Now, does Messiah expect us to be perfect? However, in expectation, no. We do not have that hanging over our head. So everybody can relax. You can be a real human being. It's okay. Paul makes it clear, in fact, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Yahuwah, Elohim. Every single person pointing fingers in condemnation is a hypocrite because they're not perfect. So they cannot criticize without being a hypocrite because they're not perfect either. If only everybody would learn this. Here we are pointing out Pharisee 11. That's what we're pointing out. That's what we're pointing to. What we are not doing is we are not condemning 
pastors. We are not condemning scholars, especially not for doing what we used to do. Hello? We ain't perfect either. We used to defend our right not to keep the Sabbath, just as they do today. They're following the same thing, and they don't know better yet, but some will because some are watching this video right now. We pray Yahuwah will open their eyes. That's what this is about. However, we condemn, reject, rebuke the leaven as we should, biblically. And we would not love them, nor you, if we did not do so. So what does Moses say on this one? Thou shalt not avenge, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord, Yahuwah. He certainly says in exact language the first part, to love thy neighbor indeed. Again, Pharisee 11 adds to that when the language is not there, because it never says to hate thine enemy. Moses doesn't say that. However, it does not say that, nor is that applicable under the law. In fact, here's Proverbs from the Old Testament. So, the Old Testament people understood this. This is from the wise Solomon. Now, there are elements of the law like this as well, finding your neighbor's ox, or I'm sorry, not your neighbor, but finding the ox of your enemy, you are to return it. But this one's a really good one, so I'm going to use this. If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. That's what Proverbs says. That's what Solomon wrote. He understood this. Not exactly hating your enemy, is it? The law never says to do so. Moses never says so. That is not a biblical concept. Messiah is addressing, nor does he say it is. He doesn't say he's addressing the law or Moses. What he says is he's, he's going after Pharisee leaven here. And it is a perfect example of how their leaven operates today in what they paint as gray areas, which are not actually, there is no gray in the Bible, doesn't actually exist. Messiah is clarifying the application is to love your neighbor and your enemy as well, biblically, and that is soundly and wholly rooted in agreement with the Old Testament and the law of Moses. For those who say, what about all that war when Israel took over the land, right? Because that's the kind of thing that we'll hear. Well, Look at whom the enemy was that is defined there, those tribes. They don't apply because they were Nephilim communities and tribes who do not even have the right to exist under the law. They are illegal in existence, period. They are pure evil and they are to be eradicated, not tolerated. They are the ones who ruined the earth so it had to be replenished with the flood. There is no requirement to love them, and the word of Yahuwah was to destroy them, their children, their animals, everything that they stand for. Everything they touch in existence is defiled and manipulated. If we miss that, and you will never understand the entire Old Testament, really. It's right there in the days of Jared, in Genesis 6. And well-defined, especially in the book of Jubilees, which the Pharisees censored. Think about that. Wonder why. And there we go. Four of the six, really five of the seven, supposedly abolished by Messiah. That's what we're hearing, and it is a lie. Sorry, it's a lie. You call it what it is. They're actually right out directly reasserting the law of Moses. Even four of them are actual Ten Commandments, in fact. Again, very directly, and condemning the doctrines of man, which had grown to misinterpret them. That's not abolishing, folks. It is the opposite. This is a lie. Then, he takes the issue of oath further, indeed, never saying it is now okay for one to no longer keep their word. 
which is what Moses' law is all about. As he cannot go against the law, especially since he stated, he started right in the beginning by stating he's not here to abolish the law, but saying that that one just should not even make an oath at all in the first place. Why? Because the Pharisee doctrine was requiring such oath and entrapping people with a manipulation of the law. See, you have to understand the times, what he was dealing with. And the same is going to come into play with Paul because they're misrepresenting his words in the same manner. And you'll see, we'll get there next. Now something Moses never says. He never says, go take an oath. It's not there. He merely says, if you do, keep your word. His law is about keeping your word, not about taking an oath. Because you represent a child of the Most High. So, one further defined. We'll give them that. Okay. And the last one we marked as changed again. We'll give them that one as changed. Although you cannot undermine the whole of the law with that one. However, in that one, scholars label as revenge, and revenge is forbidden in the law, so they don't read it, they don't know it, they don't understand it. Come on, let's just call it what it is here. So even their label is against the law. That's pretty inept when you think about it. But again, it's not their fault. They don't know, they're not taught these things. Because I've been there, Seminaries don't teach this stuff. They only teach the manipulation of it. They only teach the Pharisee leaven and interpretation, and that's why this is screwed up. Not because your pastor wants to deceive you. He does not. We would never say that. We don't believe that. But no matter, Messiah does change the tone, so no longer an eye for an eye. Indeed, though it was never to be done bearing a grudge, nor in revenge under the law, even. This we call a change, fine, but it really is not even a change in tone, nor application, really. It is a further defining as well, truly, but we'll give them that one change, and that's it. That's all they got. That's it. That's a true test, and represented with accuracy, tested for yourself. What do we conclude? Messiah reasserted the law of Moses in the Sermon on the Mount. And you and I are still subject to it. And it is a blessing, not a curse. That is a ridiculous notion. And satanic in origin. Sorry, but it is. Again, the church is fine with nine out of the ten commandments, which they even quote from Exodus, from the law of Moses. But not that one. No, not the fourth one. No, not the Sabbath. Oh, that's right. This is the Sabbath series, right? Did Messiah abolish any of the law here? No, not really. Even the one that was changed is just deepened, not abolished. However, what the Sermon on the Mount most definitely does not do is abolish the Sabbath ever. He doesn't mention Sabbath, yet reaffirms the law of Moses. And actually, even we mentioned, there's an indication that he's referring to the Sabbath and reaffirming it. It's still intact. It hasn't changed. He kept it in heaven from the beginning, in which he made the Sabbath on the seventh day for you and me, for man, for Adam. He kept it as was his custom, according to Scripture, from the time he came into the world in the flesh, until the time he ascended to heaven, and in heaven he still keeps it. So why don't we? We should. There is never any justification in Scripture to abandon his Sabbath, which he is Lord of. Is he our Lord? To do so is to spit in his face, the Lord of the Sabbath's face, which is what the Pharisee leaven is intended to do. It is time to restore his ways, his Sabbath day of rest. Will you join in on this? 
On our Facebook, we post a Shabbat Shalom scripture around the beginning of each Sabbath as a reminder. If you have not joined our Facebook, be sure to join so you get that. Next, we deal with the really big objection, although this was a big one, no doubt, to keeping the Sabbath. And the next two words out of the mouths of many, now that we know Messiah's Sermon on the Mount, reaffirms the Sabbath. Well, what are they? But Paul. Oh, we are going to deal with Paul next, coming very soon. As you can see, Scripture has been greatly manipulated in interpretation on this by lawbreakers, or as the Bible calls it, sinners, because to sin is to break the law. That's what that is. It's breaking of the law. This is the issue of our day and era, and this is one of the most important, the very most important issues. However, listen to me for a final minute, because there's something that I want to say. We are not here, nor are we about beating on pastors. Never. We don't want to see that, and we do not have any part in it. Do not use our name to attack a pastor. We have someone who did that with a large church, pastored by a great couple who in the Christian church, has restored the feast of Yahuwah, and they even embrace the name of God from our teaching, Yahuwah. However, because they still use Jesus sometimes, well, they beat up on him. We don't have a problem with that, by the way. We never have. We've never said so, and none of our teachings will support such behavior. It's immature, is what it is. We appreciate that that church has restored the feast and the Father's name. And in time, they may well embrace Yahusha as the name of the Son as well. However, this small group attempted to use us and our name injected. And they can't, because we're friends with that couple. Sorry. And we support them. And we don't condemn them. And to stand against them is to stand against us, let's be clear. This is increasing knowledge, my friends, being restored from a strong delusion in which we have all been ensnared, us included. And we ain't perfect either. However, in this endeavor, we are all to seek Him and restore His ways above all things to the best of our ability. Do you mention that to your pastor? Sure. Do you beat him over the head with it? Absolutely not. That is no way to behave. We restore the body gently. It doesn't have to be perfect, nor even pretty, but just do it. Do it in your own life and then tell others. Help them. Don't hurt them. Don't go after them. Show him he matters and is most important in your life. And others will follow that. For love, Yahuwah, your God, with all your heart, mind, and and soul. Then love your neighbor as yourself. Do you want to be beat over the head? No. Well, then you aren't practicing that commandment, are you? Because you're beating them over the head. Attacking pastors is against what we are talking about. That's not what we're saying here. But educate them, yes, they need to know these things. And they need to know that seminaries have not been teaching accuracy on this issue. Now, we don't do that, though. We don't beat them up. We aren't doing it. And many pastors are watching this right now. And we hear from them. And many of them appreciate it. And some of them are coming along and still need more. And they have questions. And that's okay. It's okay to learn. Thank you for watching our Sabbath series. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to click the bell. Like us on Facebook at The God Culture, space hyphen space, original. Share this video with others and check out our website at thegodculture.com. Always remember to prove all things for yourself. We love you all. Yahuwah bless and Shabbat Shalom or Sabbath peace if you are watching this on
the Sabbath.